Coming up this week on Breaking Badness, today we discuss the domain event. Gabriel Ku bought us-east-one.com, taking a look at security, DNS traffic, and protecting AWS users. Next up, DARPA and Greg. DARPA seeks a simple yet tricky approach to cybersecurity, breaking software into small pieces that are hard for hackers to access. And of course, our fun game, Gold Guidance and Grievances. With that, Breaking Badness is next. Welcome to Breaking Badness, episode 197, recorded on November 25th, 2024. I am your co-host, Callie, Koo and the gang, Fensel. And with me is co-host, Tim. All your misdirected traffic are belong to us helming. And last but not least, Taylor, the time for DARPA Lomacy has passed. Wilkes Pierce, welcome. Hello, gang. <laughs> nice to see you both. So we're going to we're going to first talk about the domain event which is about as a summary Gabriel Ku bought us-east-one.com and so that's taking a look at security DNS traffic and how do we protect AWS users. So Tim, I will start with you. What is this domain? Why is it so important that it was purchased and and how does it relate to AWS? Yeah, first of all, I will say that I'm astonished that domain name was available because I half would have expected Amazon to have defensively registered it. But the US-zone-number convention, naming convention, has been part of their data centers for many years, probably going back to pretty much the beginning, even, I would guess, even before Amazon Web Services became a service that they sold independent of their own use of it for their online commerce and whatnot. So you've got U.S. Dash East Dash One, U.S. Dash East Dash Two, U.S. Dash West Dash West, et cetera, et cetera. And they've got so these different regions, data center regions, and they use that naming convention. And so it is, as you can imagine, if one were to capture the amount of global DNS traffic that includes the string U.S. Dash East Dash One, which is just this one data center name that he got here. It would be staggering. There's just an immense volume of traffic that uses each of the Amazon data centers, but of course that one, and then that name us dash east dash one in actual AWS, when you complete the whole URL and getting to aws.com is itself probably behind multiple load balancers and tons of actual machines and virtual machines. It's just massive. Tim, I, I must say, as a former Amazonian, I got to jump in and say U.S. East One is the first region. There we go. That is the OG. Yeah. <laughs> and it's in Reston, Virginia or somewhere yeah. near there, right? Oh, interesting. So does this mean there's other domain names like U.S. East Dash 2? Like you said, Tim, are they yeah. already spoken for? And this was... Actually, that's interesting. So I did, as part of looking at this story, I guess what? I went into Iris Investigate. And I look, no, I, I, the really juicy ones are, are all taken. So us dash East dash one is the one we're talking about, but also the dash two is taken, not registered on the same date. Actually it's registered on the same date, but not the same year. And it's with a different registrar. I wonder if it's him that he was like, oh, when he came to his renewal time, he was like, Hey, why don't I grab East two also? So they're all under privacy. So who knows? It could be Gabriel. It might not be. And then us-west-one and -2.com also are registered. And then, you know, you could take it further and just do domain name begins with those things. And you would start to get into legit domain, probably Amazon owned domains. There's about 800 that begin with some one of those four combinations of us and east and one and two too much to go through to try to figure out who's doing what with it or try to make some inferences about that but no the simple dot coms of these and it wasn't that long ago that they were registered the earliest one of them was in 2019 and the most recent one of them was less than a year ago okay do we know who gabriel ku is and why it's significant that he bought this domain you know, he's a, he's a developer. He probably has, I would guess he does, um, a lot of AWS development and he's based in Hong Kong and he has a job, not with Amazon, but he has a job with an insurance company. And this is all, you can just link to him. He's not trying to, I'm not breaking any OPSEC here. 
but he's not a security researcher as such. That's not his main gig. He's a developer and obviously got to thinking about, I wonder what would happen if, Todd, which is where a lot of great stories begin. So what insights did he gain by purchasing this domain, specifically relating to DNS queries? Yeah. So when you own a domain like this, you could almost think of it a little bit like a honeypot because there are going to be misconfigured services and processes and stuff that are going to hit that domain. It never used to belong to Amazon. As far as I know, actually, I didn't go back and look in the history, but I, Amazon didn't set it up that way. So these are all, we can presume, misconfigurations that are hitting that domain. And they're all generally, if you look at the DNS traffic he was seeing, they're all generally fairly long host names that just end with us-east-one.com. But as much as soon as you put up a domain or even just look at a publicly routable IP address, you see a ton of traffic hitting it including things trying to hit it on well-known ports and find out what's there. In this case, it was like that, but specifically focused to traffic that included this domain name in the host names that were being looked up. And when you think about, if you register a domain and then either put that domain up with a server serving stuff, which is usually why people register domains, or even just looking at the parking page, if it's still at the registrar parking page, you have two places where you can find really interesting traffic. One of them is as if, when you register a domain name, you then have control of the authoritative name server for that domain. So if you look at all the queries that come to the authoritative server, you're going to see interesting stuff there. And if you put some kind of service on a well-known port that's listening, or even if you just simply put a packet sniff on the external interface of that routable IP that it resolves to, you're going to see a lot of stuff there. He was mostly focused on the DNS aspect, not on the who's trying to hit the server at that domain aspect. But yeah, it gave him a lot of interesting insights into the kinds of queries that were hitting it. A lot of these were, he thought, probably unintentional, generated by AWS resources and misconfigured systems. As an example, I will do a dramatic reading now, and one of you could do interpretive dance along with this, of a one of the DNS queries. And this was the most, the top daily DNS query against his domain, prod-back-and-db.cc66uxedqt2t.us-east-one.com. 23,000 plus queries every day. So some significant service is misconfigured and trying to hit this and not getting anything that it's presumably. You don't know that phrase? That's not a common all the time. Yeah, it just rolls right off the tongue, right? That was followed by a somewhat distant second place by queries for just the domain itself, us-east-one.com. And then there's a bunch of other, there's a long tail of low volumes of queries against other host names that very obviously look like they are intended to hit some kind of backend service that's hosted on an AWS instance. Some of them include the string storage gateway in them. Some of them are related to mail, et cetera. So he's seeing a lot of these queries. And fortunately, there aren't very many of them that have a large volume of these queries. So there isn't a whole lot of stuff out there that's probably breaking for people and causing problems with important functionality. There may be some of that. And then some of it, he speculates, may be done for testing purposes. Like it's possible that somebody that was doing testing configured that knowing that was not really the legit domain, but just wanted to have it in their code. And, and maybe assuming it was just at some point until a few years ago, it was probably just an NX domain. It wouldn't resolve. And they probably assumed that would be the case. And maybe he did it for testing and intended to turn that, to change that back in five minutes after they did their test. But then they went to lunch and then they got into a big debate over whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not. And pretty soon they forgot all about that test instance that was doing that. Do you think AWS will want to purchase this domain from Ku or can it remain in his possession? I don't know. That's a good question. I think if I were Amazon, I might be interested in owning these, but 
The tricky thing about it is if this turned into some kind of a legal thing, could Amazon make a claim on such a generic string of as us dash east dash one? It doesn't include any trademarks or their name or anything like that. It's widely known in the developer community that, of course, that's an AWS uh, data center. And so they might have some kind of a claim that way. It's not obvious to me that they have reached out or, or tried to do that. He doesn't say anything about that in his article. If the domain had been transferred to Amazon, my guess is that it wouldn't still be under privacy. It probably would be publicly in the Whois record as Amazon because they tend to publicly acknowledge their stuff. Of course, there could be lots that they own that is behind privacy and we wouldn't know that. But also it would be likely that it would be hosted on, guess what? AWS, right? <laughs> Which it is not currently. So I don't think they have tried to get this domain from Gabriel or likewise any of the other four that are the principal kind of ones here that we're looking at it. But I think it wouldn't be a terrible idea for them to do, gosh, this is the second week in a row. I'm going to talk about defensive registrations. It might not be a terrible idea for them to do that. If nothing else, as a courtesy, put up a page there that says, I do not think this domain is doing what you think it's doing. <laughs> and you might want to check your configurations and so forth. So yeah, there's no evidence that they are actually trying to do. And how can people mitigate risks associated with misconfigurations or typos in domain names? If in case your resources are connected to the wrong domain yep. and it's owned by somebody like Gabriel Koo instead of the entity you think it's owned by, like, how would you solve for that? Yeah. It, so first off, stuff will break. If you have something that is trying to actually reach a resource that's in the AWS US East one data center, and you've misconfigured it to go to us dash east dash one.com, it's going to break. It's not going to work. You're going to, as a developer that is trying to make use of your AWS resources, you probably don't have to take a lot of proactive action on this because unless it's the thing that breaks is really trivial, unimportant, infrequently used. No one's going to notice that it's broken. Okay, that might happen, but if that's the case, then is it really that big a deal? Probably not. So I think the, but the bigger concern here is if a malicious actor registered these domains and was able to somehow have malicious responses to those queries that came in, that could be more troubling. The thing is, it's going to be so much random stuff and so many random different kinds of queries that would hit it, that would there be a universal malicious thing that they could do that would hose all of them? I don't know, probably not. So I don't know that it would get you real far as a malicious actor, but if you observed the traffic that was coming in and then, so here I am giving a blueprint to the malicious actors, thanks. But if you observed these queries that were coming in and you saw a repeated one and you decided you wanted to do something malicious, you might be able to make a little bit more of an inference about what that was supposed to be and then what kind of payload you should return in order to do something malicious. It would take a lot of guesswork on the data actor's part. It would be more of a risk if there was a specific kind of query that was known where the actual domain lapsed and the owner forgot to renew it and you snagged it and now you're intercepting traffic and you know what that traffic is and you know what you want to accomplish. That would be more dangerous. But I think mostly the queries are probably going to fail. Whatever it is you're trying to do is going to fail. And that's how you're going to notice that you had that misconfiguration. Okay. So it'll be very quick. To it would be the quick as of the first time that it happens. Again, if it's something that only fires off once every blue moon, then it might not be quick per se, but the failure, once the traffic happened, the failure would be immediate. Yeah. Thanks, Tim, for walking us through this article. This leads us into our hoodie reading. Really quick for our listeners, after we, if you're a new listener, first of all, thank you. Or viewer. Now. Or viewer, because we are on YouTube now, if you uh, prefer to get your content that way rather than just listening to it. But we, podcasting in color. We do like to do a hoodie rating. So if you can imagine a stereotypical hacker in a hoodie and a scale from one to 10, 10 hoodies is very bad. And Tim is modeling his hoodie if you're watching this on YouTube. And one is you can go about your business. It's just FYI, no, no serious harm done. But for this scenario, I'm not really, it's not 
inherently bad. So it's, does a hoodie rating make sense for this? Or do we want to give it a hoodie rating based on if somebody nefarious had bought US dash East dash one? If I had done it. I'm looking at it. This domain was registered back in 2016 for the first time. This is not even the first go around for US dash East dash one.com. We've been yelling about this for a very long time here. I don't know. I can go back and look at presentations I gave in 2018 that say, hey, you should probably defensively register certain things. and But not everything because there's DNS has this like temporal component to it where there's new zones, there's new namespaces, right? In the GTLD process, you may be a development shop that uses internally what you think are non-routable addresses. And then all of a sudden... Someone gets $300,000 and decides to turn that into a TLD space. And now you may have a problem. So this is hardly a new thing. I will say it's interesting to see the, the amount of queries that they picked up, but there's a lot of scanning. There's a lot of, it, it's an interesting honeypot. It's an interesting theory or interesting data to pull in, but from a hoodie aspect, it's not, it's, I'm going to go one and a half hoodies because it does remind us, check all your records. One hoodie and a crop. Hoodie. Tim, what about you? I'm going to go in a different direction with this, and I actually am going to give it goodies specifically to what Gabriel did here because he wrote a great blog post, so we're linking to it in the show notes. You should check it out. It's cool. And he did this as a public service saying, hey, y'all ought to pay attention to these kinds of things. And DNS, it should be an important part of your security stack or security practice. He recommends maybe you want to use a protective DNS or something like that. So it's a great article, and I'm Awarding the goodies for that and just the awareness thing that he did with this piece of research. So I'll give it five. It's about this is the week of Thanksgiving here in the U.S. that we're recording this. So I'm not going to go with my usual chocolate chip goodies. I'm going to go with actually pumpkin spice goodies, but of the edible kind, not the drinkable kind, in keeping with the uh, Thanksgiving kind of theme. In this article, we're talking about DARPA seeking a simple yet tricky approach to cybersecurity, which is breaking software into smaller pieces that would make it harder for hackers to access. So that's pretty interesting. So Taylor, for those that might not know, what is DARPA? DARPA uh, is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administer Agency. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, and so it's funny because they've gone back, they've been DARPA and they've been ARPA. And then they've gone back and forth between DARPA and ARPA, but they were launched back in the 50s, the start of the Cold War, as a response to what was seen as, at the time, a competitive advantage on the science side of the house for the Soviet Union. So they came in and said, hey, we can give us the big, tough projects to handle. And so some things you might know them from the internet, invented the internet. And Who's now they're for that? And now they're here to fix it. <laughs> you're like, shoot. They're like, you did it wrong. Everyone did it wrong. There's not enough cat pictures. Not enough cat pictures. Yes. The whole thing is actually to make it more cat friendly. So can you explain, Taylor, like the concept of this compartmentalization in cybersecurity and how it relates to, to this latest initiative? Yeah, it's real because this is an interesting article because it's very high level and they're talking to Dr. Strobe, who is... Now, at his third go around at DARPA, he's come in and out of MIT. We have very smart people working on these problems, which is great. A big part of their approach here is to work to almost add a dimension of privilege to computing, both on the hardware on and on the software level. So they're approaching it from, A, how do we do this from the, like, the ground up with hardware that allows for segmentation of privilege as a concept in a better fashion, and then... How do we then build on the software side to then put everything in? Like they're coming at it from the, hey, it's a big ship and ships are built with compartments to help it. If you hit an iceberg, then you don't sit. Even though I, I would argue that like computing's a little different because some of the compartments want to attack each other. And like, I think the metaphor gets a little strained. But from a like privileges and development design perspective, they're saying, Hey, there's a lot of like general purpose computing that allows for a lot of privileges. And we try to tamp it down by allowing what things have access to. But generally, you've got lots of different people writing software that has to interoperate. And then your privileges overlap. And we end up seeing as a, a very breakable form of computing. No, so would you say from that 
perspective, those are the main technical challenges associated with this approach, or are there others that we should be aware of? So they're looking, they're really looking at it from, they're taking a very broad view at it. And it's a four-year program that kicks off early next year. They started talking about this a couple of years back, but essentially they're going to start with Linux as an operating system. And they're going to start looking at how to better harden Linux as an operating system for certain user land things. So they'll start with the web aspect of Linux. They'll start with parts of user land that they can then compartmentalize from the compiler level. And then also they're working on the hardware level to help develop hardware that allows to extend this privilege, these thoughts around privilege and how it gets assigned to the different compartments, both on the hardware level, all the way down to the operating system. And then that gets inherited, hopefully in user land. But again, it's a four-year program. They're hoping to have a couple of things in Linux user lands that look like this kind of thought of how they could compute things, but it's very interesting. <laughs> when there's a precedence in some ways, one of the first places I would look if I were thinking about how to do this is that so many security devices are based on hardened Linux kernels and they have to address hardware all the way down in some cases to chips, like some of the firewall vendors make their own ASICs and they have to think about how privileged processes talk to each other and hardening things by, you know, removing obviously unneeded services and all of that stuff. So there's a bit of an, I would say like a higher level blueprint for some of what this ought to look like in the security appliance world, but they're talking about some new concepts here that go a lot further than that. Yeah. Getting memory safety all over the place. So other things that the DARPA folks are working on right now, like their tractor program, which is going to get all that C into Rust, this translating C into Rust tractor using AI to, which is a little scary. It's like, hey, we'll just have the robots write us this Rust code. Go wrong. C a language, it's memory unsafe. Rust a language, it's very memory safe. And so part of this is they're looking at it like, hey, we want to do this without impacting performance too much. So they've got specific goals around, hey, we know we're going to impact performance by 15% here in year two, but we want to get that down to 5% by year three. Again, because when you add this layer, or add this, think of this concept of privilege from a compartmentalization perspective from hardware down, you're adding an abstraction layer, which is going to cost performance either on the CPU side or RAM side or both, depending on how they do it. But yeah, they have very specific goals that they want to achieve from a performance perspective. And they've got some interesting concepts on how they're going to get started. And then it's, hey, can we build this and then build the tool set that then allows future developers to develop in this fashion that then inherits all of this work that we're doing and eventually makes folks safer. And then I, you talked a little bit about the AI element of it, but what about incorporating the elements of zero trust or maybe you, you did Least that privilege, without... zero trust. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah like you did it without saying the buzzword. Your buzzwords. Like, yeah. Uh, sentence and say the buzzword. Yeah. Zero trust and least privilege kind of principles baked in. And then again, finding ways to logically compartmentalize use, it's user land <laughs> and, and, and kernel land and all that fun stuff. A bit of a moonshot as it were to say, Hey, we're going to completely come up with a new way that you should be doing this. That's going to be a lot safer than the way that you're doing it right now. And so they're starting Starting with the OS layer, they'll move into the application layer. And then hopefully along the way, this is all going to result in a very open tool set that developers can then take and then work with OS manufacturers and hardware manufacturers to better secure everything. Cool. If this is successful and we're talking about this in four years and beyond, what do you think the long-term impact of this approach would be to national security and the cybersecurity landscape as a whole? It's going to put us all out of work. No. <laughs> I think, again, things will shift to different parts of the stack. The people will always be important and that's not going to change. It'll get pushed to where the people are. But I've, I came up with a fun game because I, I, I did some research on DARPA as a part of this. And you go down these fun little rabbit holes. And so I've come up with three truths and a lie. Okay. And so these are project names from DARPA. I'm going to give you four. Three of them are real. One of them is fake. Okay. Okay. First one, the sleepy giant exploration effort. Okay. Okay. Second one, ursid exposure to tropical environments. Third one, six hypotheses for accelerating the lunar economy. Uh, and that is obviously an acronym of shale. And then warfighter and defense-related outfits to buffer extreme environments. 
I'm going to go with the second one is the lie. I'm going to say that. I, I don't know. It's just a gut feeling. It could be wrong. I'm going to go with the second one. Did that have, say the second one again? Yeah. Ursid exposure to tropical environments. Like bears on the beach. Uh, basically, there's on the beach. Uh, there's on the beach. Yeah, that's a good possibility. I I don't know. For some reason, I I feel like the moon one might be the lie. So just for variety's sake, since Callie guessed the second one, I'm going to guess the third one. The moon one is the lie. Callie is right. The second one, Earth's exposure to tropical environments. That's actually the Dharma Initiative from Lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh very good, very good. Just to give you a feel. <laughs> the projects that DARPA likes to throw themselves at. But this one, it is really interesting. It, it, it's something to keep an eye on, but yeah. Excellent. I feel, we haven't done like a two truths and a lie in a long time. Yeah, we were going to alternate that with uh, gold guidance and grievances, but we've enjoyed gold guidance yeah. and grievances so much. I think we just stuck with it. This is fun too, though. I yeah, forgot because I'm, I feel like I won a lot at it. Three proof. Oh, that's the worst. That's why I like it. I'm too trusting. I believe everybody. I'm skeptical of everyone and everything, but seriously. Well, that's a good infosec posture. Taylor, thank you so much for talking us through this. I feel like this is another one, though, now that we've gotten to the end. More goodies than uh, hoodies. Yeah. yeah. And like, is this a hoodie? This feels like a good goodie. It's or like good. I think it's a goodie. Yeah. I'll give this eight delicious pumpkin spice goodies with your pumpkin squares, Callie with either topping that we discussed earlier or take your choice. I think it is an admirable initiative. I think it's very ambitious, especially in a four-year time horizon, but it's the right idea. We've talked about this before. Security is least privilege all the way down, like from humans all the way down to hardware. And at every single layer in there, it's the more secure a system is, the better it will have implemented least privilege. And so this is taking that in uh, an interesting and good direction and we'll all be watching. But DARPA does some interesting things. It doesn't all have fantastic acronyms. Some of it does. I'm supportive of this effort for sure. The acronym game is really strong there. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. There's, they probably have a department of acronyms. Taylor, what about you? What are you feeling? Yeah, look, I think absolutely on the goodies scale, of th it's one of these things where it's, they've got to pull it off. There's a lot of moving parts here, but it's a really interesting approach. I do like the people who broke computing by inventing the internet are now coming back. <laughs> trying to mop up. <laughs> trying to fix it, which is great. Let's Sorry, go, guys. <laughs> yeah, we'll go eight pumpkin treats. I'll go eight. Yeah, eight is great. We'll go eight pumpkin treats, eight slices of pumpkin pie or whatever. And we all feel sick afterwards, but it's a good sick. Like, I shouldn't have done that, but I'm glad I did that. Yeah. Right. As otherwise, there, some stuff would have gotten thrown away. Yeah. There's yeah. probably a German word for happy regret. We'll have to ask our CISO, Daniel, about that. Yeah. Well, although, you know what else? We have been seeing a pickup in listenership in Germany. Oh. If you're in Germany. That's because I've been telling people we're huge. Yeah, comment down below. Tell us. Yeah, we are huge with the German set. <laughs> But all right, we've reached the end, gentlemen. We've reached the end of the episode. But before we go, we're going to close it out with... So again, if you're a newer listener, we like to share something good from the past week, any tips we might have and anything that's bothering us. But of course, we do it in the reverse order and on the gold because it's just too bleak to end on the grievance. So we'll start there. And since we just heard from Taylor, Tim, we'll start with you. All right, grievance first. You may have seen the news that China has broken basically all of the telecoms and they are intercepting possibly everything pretty much. And so I have a rather large bone to pick with China over that. And we may decide to pursue that as more of a story on breaking badness. So that's a rather giant grievance that I have. Guidance, Apple had some OS updates recently, and there are some kind of nasty vulnerabilities, some of which are being exploited in the wild. So update your Apple stuff if you are in Apple land of the handheld as well as desktops, laptop type variety. And then for gold, we all love the onion. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that everybody loves the onion. And now, weirdly enough, you can love Newsmax because it's owned by the onion. I have not looked there to see if they've unified it already or not, but sometimes it's fun to see offbeat 
stories in this stressful age that we live in, offbeat stories that are for real. And it turns out that UPI, United Press International, has a URL, upi.com slash odd underscore news. And so if you want to find out about what turned out to be behind the shoes being stolen serially from a kindergarten, it turns out that was a weasel that was doing that. It's been camera evidence has confirmed that was a weasel. And so these are true stories. And uh, you can learn about the Wisconsin 10 year old who dialed 911 for help with math homework. There are a couple of stories on there right now that have to do with horses. Interestingly enough, but you'll have to go find those yourself. So upi.com slash odd underscore news. It's gold. Yeah, that's fun. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Hey, what about you? Starting with your grievances and working your way backwards. Yeah, grievances. It's a grievance, a grievance and a guidance thing. I don't know. So cyber work on was what just happened for all those who celebrate. <laughs> so, and Really interesting report from Velexity that talking about how a the Wi-Fi network next door to a victim was successfully targeted, then used to move over essentially to, which is really interesting, but also a, a grievance that now you have to go like smash your neighbor's Wi-Fi, which is a guidance. So go smash your neighbor's Wi-Fi because it could be used to break into, no, I'm kidding. But that's a guidance. And then gold is they just arrested a bunch of scattered spider people. That's great. Yes. Yeah. I, saw that. That's, I thought about doing that for my gold too. Oh yeah. So I yeah. just extradited someone from Canada and then arrested a, a U.S. individual. I think looks like they got popped in Turkey. Is that okay. in any event, but both of those folks are now in custody. Awesome. We've reached the end. This has been a great episode, you guys. Thanks so much for coming with your insights and, and sharing your opinions on these articles. And yeah, it's fantastic. And of course, thank you to our listeners as always. We always appreciate you coming in and, and listening to us or watching us now on YouTube. So please do that. Please come back uh, next week. We're going to have another all new episode of Breaking Badness and we can't wait for you to join us. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's about all we have for this week. You can find us on Twitter at Domain Tools. All of the articles mentioned today will be included in our blog post, which can be found at blog.domaintools.com. Catch us every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time when we publish our podcast and blog. That's it for this week. We'll see you again next week on another episode of Breaking Badness. Until then, remember, don't drink and click. <laughs>